Good morning. My name is Sierra Anderson. I'm part of the legal team here at Rathod Muhammad Bai, representing these families standing behind me. I'd like to start by introducing the families, each of whom live in the Littleton Public School District. Throughout the press conference, you'll notice that I'll only use their first names. We're doing this to protect their privacy and their children. I'd like to start off by introducing Jess and Devin, Brittany and Kevin, and Jessica and Blake. Today we'll go through the documents that have been shared publicly on our website. Then the family has given us permission to share the video of one of the incidents of abuse that one of their children endured. You'll then hear from the families. And when you hear from them, you'll hear immeasurable amount of pain, heartbreak, anger, and utter disillusionment at what they're experiencing. Finally, you'll hear about the legal parameters of this matter from Mr. Ed Hopkins. This case is a sorely needed spotlight on the treatment of students with disabilities in Colorado's school system. Littleton Public School District is yet another school district that has failed the most vulnerable people in our population, children with disabilities. Three children, all of whom are autistic, nonverbal, and rely on caretakers to meet their basic needs, were subjected to unspeakable acts of abuse while they were in Littleton Public School District's care. The circumstances surrounding the abuses provide a somber reminder of the capacity of some people in our commu communities to hurt the most vulnerable people in our communities. They also speak to the abject failures of our school districts to protect children. Beginning in approximately September 2023, each family standing here saw significant shifts in their children's behavior. They also noticed physical injuries on their child, including unexplained scratches, bruises, a lost tooth, a black eye, a broken toe, and other deep bruises and marks on the bodies of their 10-year-old children. I'd like to turn to the documents that the family has given us permission to share publicly on our website. We'll begin with some of the photos of the injuries that their children sustained. You'll see the third photo was a, is a photo from October of 2023. This is an incident where a child came off the bus with a bleeding ear with no explanation. Then, in January of 2024, there was significant bruising by another child. This bruising prompted questions and concerns, and rightfully so. And based on these bruises, the Joshua School emailed Littleton Public School District, putting them on notice of potential abuse. In response, Littleton Public School District utterly failed. They did a sham investigation in which they looked at one ride in the day before. They did no other investigation, they asked no other questions, and they provided no other monitoring. Because of these horrific failures by the school district, the bus aide was emboldened to continue her abuse. And she did. There are photos after the school district was put on notice of additional injuries. On January 23rd, a young man, a child, was, came home with a busted lip and, lost, and a lost tooth. This tooth hadn't previously been loose. Then on February 13th, 2024, there's significant bruising on one of these children's neck. No other investigation was done. Then on March 18th, 2024, there's bruising on his foot. And th these bruises are what ultimately led to the video that we're going to watch. But I'd also like to point out that on our website, there's an arrest affidavit, and it describes unspeakable harms 
to a child on February 13th, a month after Littleton Public School District was put on notice of abuse. Now I'd like to turn to the video. The video, the family has given us permission to share the raw video. And, the raw, and this is raw footage of their son's abuse. And I'll warn you, this video is sickening. You will be outraged. This is absolutely disgusting. Our children deserve better. Thank goodness for these parents standing up here advocating so hard for their children. I want to redirect you again to the photo of the bruising on the foot. This is a result of that, that video that we just watched. And we've only seen one video. There's so much more we have not seen. I want to turn it over to the families to talk about their experiences in this process. Hi, my name is Jess, and I've had the honor of being that little boy's mom for 10 years. He is the sweetest, most affectionate little boy I have ever known. He loves to go on adventures, sleep in, and cozy up on the couch to watch movies. Dex has severe autism and is completely nonverbal. He relies solely on us as his parents and caregivers to protect and support his needs at the most basic level. In 2021, we moved to Colorado for better resources for Dax's development. After being a placed at the Joshua School, Dax made so many achievements and friends. His teachers absolutely adore him and all know him for his big bear hugs. 
In September, Dex began riding the Littleton School District's bus to and from school, not by necessity, but to expand his autonomy and give him the experience of a typical school day. On January, Dex came home with enormous bruising all over his thighs, arms, ribs, and underarm area, as well as his clavicle. This sparked months of documentation and vigorous communication between TJS and I. With several unexplained injuries peppered in throughout the months between January and current, things finally came to a head on March 18th when Dax came home with the intense bruising that you saw in that picture on his foot, as well as bruising on his ear and thigh. I notified Littleton Public School on 318 and on 319 got a phone call from Sergeant Johnny Evans with the Littleton Police Department informing me that the Littleton Public School employee had severely abused my child. I was immediately thrown into disbelief. How could someone that I trusted, someone that I was so friendly with, do this to my little boy? I had to see for myself. I went to the Littleton Pool School District Transportation Building and watched the video you all just watched and was in utter shock. A wave of betrayal ran through me, and I haven't stopped fighting for him since that moment, and I won't until he has justice for him and all children like him. If I could say one thing to Littleton Public Schools, it would be, how dare you? How dare you fail my son in such an astonishingly preventable way? Had bus footage been routinely audited, the torture and torment of my sweet boy could have been stopped. Had this monster never been employed by them, the cancer that she is couldn't have mis metastasized. You will do better, not by choice, as your actions have shown, but by force. The army of moms and dads behind me will never stop advocating for our children to be safe and loved by the adults that we trust with them. We are sharing this all with you and hopefully the world because although it is hard to watch, that is what my child has endured for months due to inaction by Littleton Public Schools. He had to live through that every day. The least that we can do is bring awareness to a situation that is unfortunately more common than you would think. There needs to be change. There needs to be procedures and consequences to make sure that these children are safe. I will not sit idly by as children much like my own are harmed in spaces meant to protect and serve them. And I would like to formally thank the staff of the Joshua School for working so closely with our families to support our children in this horrific time and for loving them always as well as Detective Ronick and Sergeant Evans with the Littleton Police Department and Detective Brian, Herna or, I'm sorry, Brian Martinez with Inglewood Police for their swift action and diligence in this investigation. My name is Devin. I am Dax's dad, the child in the video. At the end of 2021, I transferred to Colorado via my job at the United States Postal Service. We lived in a small town in rural Illinois that had little to no resources for parents of children with autism <coughs> as severe as my son's. We moved here because of how highly spoken of the resources, education, and support the state of Colorado provides in those to those in our situation. On March 19th, my wife called me at work and through her tears told me that she was informed by the police that our absolute worst fears as parents had become reality. My sweet and loving son. Had been being beaten. assaulted to agree to a degree I would consider torture 
on multiple days while in the care of Littleton Public Transportation. I immediately rushed home to share in grief and horror with my wife as we learned of and saw more horrific abuse than I could possibly imagine happen to my son. As a father, one of my most important duties is to protect my family from harm. When I entrusted Littleton Public Schools with my son, it wasn't done lightly. The most sacred thing I can trust someone with is my children, especially when my son is incapable of telling me that he is being abused. Through lack of action, accountability, and frankly, a lack of care, it has again been made abundantly clear how low my son and his needs are on the social totem pole as far as the school system is concerned. They took my trust and they spit on it. They remained silent and complacent when my son needed them the most. In turn, I will not be silent or complacent. We will attempt to piece back our broken family in the wake of what they did and didn't do while making the world aware that this happened on their watch and we expecting nothing less than full accountability for their failure. My name is Brittany. My husband Kevin and I, along with our three children, moved into the Littleton Public School District in February of 2020 for the educational needs of our son Hunter. Hunter is 11 and he is a beautiful, happy boy who enjoys waving at everyone he sees. His smile is contagious and he often laughs incessantly for seemingly no reason at all. He's just as eager to get back scratches from mom and dad as he is to irritate his brother and sister. While most children his age are playing outside or on their phones, Hunter enjoys watching Coco Melon nursery rhymes, spinning empty Gatorade bottles on the floor, and playing with toys designed for toddlers. He has intellectual disabilities, life-threatening autism, and he is non-speaking. He is a part of society's most vulnerable population because he depends on trusted adults for all of his needs, including his safety. Despite his diagnosis, he is a hard worker who fights relentlessly for every developmental gain alongside his dedicated teachers and staff at school. Hunter is a student within the Littleton Public School District, but li like most districts, Littleton does not have the ability to accommodate for his significant needs within their schools. So they arrange for him to attend an out-of-district placement. He goes to the Joshua School, a specialized facility that offers one-to-one -one instruction to meet the needs of our son and who are committed to helping each individual with autism and developmental disabilities attain the highest quality of life. LPS provided for my son to attend the Joshua School and they also provided the transportation for him to get there. We believe that riding the school bus every day would be an opportunity for Hunter to enhance his education, for him to learn new skills and gain independence and increase his confidence and abilities. We trusted that LPS would keep our son safe while transporting him to school. We believe that they would uphold their legal duty to properly screen their employees to ensure that they were qualified, safe, and fully trained to care for our child. We trusted that Littleton Public Schools would regularly supervise and monitor the bus's video footage for any safety issues that may occur during our son's 20 minute ride to school. That trust was betrayed. Hunter had unexplained injuries beginning in the fall of 2023. Scratches, bumps, and bruises are not uncommon among children, but the placement on his body and unknown cause of these injuries raised alarms. In September, after monitoring a worsening limp for about a week, we took him to Children's Hospital Orthopedics where x-rays confirmed that he had a fracture of his third metatarsal in his right foot. The Joshua School is very helpful in determining that these injuries did not occur at school. And since we knew they didn't happen at home, we were left with only unanswered questions. We never could have imagined that the answer was that someone could be hurting our child. Just three weeks ago, we received a phone call from the Joshua School informing us that Dax had been intentionally harmed by an LPS employee during his ride home. I went to speak with the Joshua School about this incident and learned that the teachers and staff were very concerned that my son could have also been a victim. The injuries sustained by Dax were far too similar to Hunter's injuries. And reasonable assumptions can be made that based on the way Dax was abused, 
my son's injuries might finally have an explanation. I couldn't process the information being presented to me, however, and I didn't want to accept it. But last week, I sat in utter disbelief as I finally watched the footage of an LPS professional brutally assaulting Dex. My heart dropped and I felt physically ill, watching him tortured repeatedly and seeing the confusion and terror on his face. It was only then that I accepted the horrifying reality that my son was likely also subjected to the same abuse. I was further outraged when I learned that LPS does not regularly monitor school bus footage and only reviews it when an issue or complaint has been raised. Frustratingly, what happened to our children is not unique. Seven years ago, an autistic teenager was abused by a paraprofessional on a bus in St. Vrain Valley School District. Less than a year ago, a disabled kindergartner was abused on a bus in the Pooter School District. I feel heartbroken and betrayed by a system that continually fails our children and refuses to make the necessary changes to keep them safe. This shouldn't have happened again. I want justice for our children. I want Littleton Public Schools held accountable for their inaction and negligence. And that's why I'm here sharing the pain my son and family has endured. Pain creates change and I am demanding appropriate change so that no other mother has to feel this again. I'm Kevin, I'm Hunter's father. Uh, 11 years ago, my dream came true, and I became a father to my first son. Like any father, I looked him in the eyes, and I promised that I'd always be there to protect him. Three years later, when we learned that Hunter had autism and would never be able to speak on his own, I again looked him in the eyes, promised that I would be there to be his voice. I'm here today because I've failed. I failed that promise by getting him ready in the morning, walking him down to the bus stop, and putting him on the bus with a monster. I failed him by trusting that the ladies on the bus and the people of the Littleton School District would also be there to protect him. I had assumed that the new bumps and bruises that he would come home with were from a 11-year-old that liked to play rough. I had assumed that when his teachers told me that he was having a rough time getting off the bus at school, that it may have been just because he was having a bad day. Again, I was wrong. Instead, there was a grown woman on the bus that was verbally and physically torturing my son and his friends. My son does not have the ability to tell me when someone's hurting him. My son does not have the ability to tell me that he was forced to watch as someone hurt his friends. My son was abused by the people that were put in place specifically to protect him. I'm now asking for help. Please help me give my son and his friends a voice. Please help us hold the people responsible for these acts accountable. And please help me advocate for my son, his friends, and kids everywhere who are not able to stand up for themselves. My four-year-old daughter tells me she's afraid of the boogeyman. My 11-year-old son knows what the boogeyman looks like and didn't have the ability to tell anyone he was afraid. My name is Jessica. Um, I am Andrew's mom. My husband Blake and I here um, have struggled to find words today to adequately express how incredibly horrified and appalled we are in learning the treatment of Dax. 
on our Littleton Public Schools bus. Our son Andrew is 10. Andrew has been riding the Littleton Public Schools transportation for over a year now. Um, when we got our new para and new bus back in the fall of 2023, we were excited. We were excited to see new friends on the bus, um, excited for the autonomy and the ability to gain new skills in being out, away from parents. And as of the past two weeks, we've been nothing but heartbroken and saddened to learn that Andrew was identified as a second victim by Inglewood Police Department in relation to the abuse that Dax and likely Hunter and likely all of our other classmates endured for months. I'm here today because I want to ensure that spaces and places where not only our children but any non-speaking individual is are protected and safe as so many of these parents have shared with you today, our children are unable to communicate for themselves independently. They are unable to tell us when someone is hurting them or when they hurt. We often have to do a lot of fact finding to try and determine sources of bruises, of illness, of injury. And the last several months have been nothing but that. Countless bruises, countless scratches, countless injuries, which we had no explanation for and seemed to fall on deaf ears. So I stand with these families and my son and the rest of my children and ask that you please pay attention. Take your heads up out of your phones, pay attention to what's going on because if it can happen on a public school bus, it can happen anywhere. And we need to do better as a community to ensure that our children and our loved ones are protected. My name is Blake. Andrew's father. Not really good at this. So, uh, Andrew has many medical complications. One of being he's non-speaking. He has non-speaking autism. Uh, every day is a struggle to provide the best care that we can for him. And I really am struggling to find the words to express to you guys how, how much this has really taken a toll on our family and more on Andrew. We do our best as his parents, as his advocates, to find the most appropriate and safest care that we can for him. And we trusted LPS with our son's care and his life in providing just the transportation to school. And they failed us. We heard from the LPS superintendent, Todd Lambert, three days after, and he ensured us that he, that our son was not present or a victim in this case, and not more than 24 hours, we were told by Inglewood Police Department that he was the second victim. We haven't seen the video. We've, we've asked for the videos and were met with lies. And we we want Littleton to be held accountable for what has happened to our children. I don't have any, I'm sorry, just my hands.
I'm Edward C. Hopkins, Jr., call me Ed. I'm here because, along with my colleagues at the firm, Radad Mohammed Bai, we are going to hold Liberton Public Schools fully accountable. You've heard from the families. You've heard about this horror story that we will continue investigating. At the end, however, they will be held accountable. Keep our children safe. That's your first job. That's more important than teaching our children. Keep them safe. It's more important than feeding our children at school. You have to keep them safe. There should be signs placed all around public schools that remind everyone who needs reminding, keep them safe is your job. How Littleton Public Schools could utterly fail at the primary mission, the most important thing that they are called to do is astonishing. We all should be outraged. We all should be shocked. We all should be more than angry. If you are not angered by this, what gets you angry? The most vulnerable children in our society, beaten, tortured, mentally and physically, because Littleton Public Schools failed to do job number one. We're going to hold them accountable. Parents presume that these schools are going to keep their children safe. If they didn't presume that, they couldn't hand over their most precious things, their children to these schools for hours every day. They couldn't do it. Now, when that trust is betrayed, how are the parents to cope with it? How are they going to pick up the pieces? It's not going to be an easy road. It's not going to be an easy year. The lifetime is going to be hard for the parents and the children as a result of this torture. It was torture. That's what Torture is when someone beats you, verbally abuses you, and you can't defend yourself. You can't stop it. You can't cry out for help. You're trapped. That's what happened to these children. Because Littleton Public Schools failed. That's why it hurts so much. That's why it shocks us so much. That's why it angers us so much. We all presume that Littleton Public Schools understood the number one job. No one would send their kids there if they didn't think that. Then we learn that Littleton Public Schools failed. We are here because of that failure. Let me read a few lines from the arrest warrant that's on our website. It will show you that this wasn't one person who failed. This was institutional failure. Multiple people had to fail for this to happen. This didn't happen once. It didn't happen twice. It didn't happen one week. It happened over months. There was video in the bus, and it still happened over months. The family reached out to the school, and it still continued to happen over months. That's failure. Timestamp, February 13, 2024. 1448.45. For those who don't have military backgrounds, that's 248.45 seconds. She looks towards the bus driver and she hits redacted in the mouth with the closed fist of her right hand. While I'm reading this, imagine the child you love most. Imagine that name when I say redacted because that's going to help you understand what these parents are feeling right now. She looks towards the bus driver and she hits redacted in the mouth with the closed fist of her right hand. The punch is so redacted's head goes back and hits the seat. Redacted is seen possibly tying, trying to unbuckle the seatbelt. 
it appears redacted. It's checking redacted's mouth. By the way, redacted is moving. Redacted is breathing heavily. Timestamp, February 13, 2024. 1459, 42 seconds. She hits redacted in the abdomen. She elbows redacted twice in the chest as she is speaking with the bus driver. She elbows redacted in the face. She puts her right hand behind redacted's head and pulls redacted's hair. Redacted is the child you love most. They treated these children as if they were redacted as if they were not important enough to protect. That's what happened in Littleton Public Schools for months. The public has some questions. We have some answers, not all the answers. We're gonna get all the answers. The most important question that everybody's thinking is who's to blame? This could not have happened because of one person. This could not have happened because of just that one person and the bus driver. This is institutional failure. Institutional failure for months. They had everything they needed to stop it faster, and they didn't. They had notice, and they ignored it. These children have been traumatized and tortured because they failed them. Will the family sue Littleton Public Schools for failing to keep their children safe? If Littleton Public Schools doesn't hold itself fully accountable, and they know what fully accountable is going to look like here. It's going to be significant. If they don't agree to do it, we're going to make them do it. So yes, the family will sue if Littleton Public Schools does not hold itself fully accountable for this utter, complete, traumatic failure. What can everyone else do to help? I hope everyone else is asking that. What can you do? to help these families, these children. Number one, first and foremost, remember these are real people. This is not just a story. These are real families. This is not just a shocking event. Respect their dignity. Empathize with them. Be good neighbors. Second, and this is very important, because as you start watching the video and determining what you think about the video, it's going to be important to keep everybody else on point, on focus. Please discourage others from politicizing this horror story. Don't turn this into a political story. This is not a political story. This is about families. This is about children. This is not about race. Everybody knows the woman in the bus is black, yes, but this is not about race. Don't turn it into a race story. This is about families picking up pieces, trying to figure out how they're going to do this now that they have to deal with torture. Torture in their children's lives at such a young age. It's going to affect them for a lifetime. Third, remind everyone that you trust with your children that job number one is keep them safe. On the way to school, keep them safe. At school, keep them safe. When you're getting them back home, keep them safe. It appears as though some folks still need to be reminded. We're gonna do the best we can to help these families remind our public schools that their number one job is keep them safe. Who has questions? What does that full accountability mean? Okay, the full accountability is going to be making sure that the families have whatever they need whatever they need to pick up the pieces. Someone's gonna have to pay for what they need to pick up the pieces. Imagine having to deal with children suffering from autism, nonverbal, trapped on a bus, being tortured for months. How is that going to affect them psychologically? How is that going to affect them physically? And how long is it going to affect them? Probably a lifetime. But while their parents are doing everything that they can, to help their children cope with this, help their children recover from this, if it can be recovered from, the parents are going to need help too. Their lives are different forever. Now, they have to make more adjustments to their lives to try to make the job of parenting as good as it gets. 
in spite of it all. So we expect there to be long-term care needs for the children. We expect there to be long-term care needs for the families. And we expect there to be institutional changes in Littleton Public Schools. We expect Littleton Public Schools to raise their hand and say, we failed these families. We're going to fix what we did wrong. We are going to hold ourselves fully accountable and give you whatever you need. That's what we hope they're going to do. If they don't come out and do that without our help, we'll help them do it. Anybody else have any questions? Can you get last name of your parents or do we just need to protect We'd like to protect their privacy as much as we can. Uh, for now, we would like to limit it to their first name. Uh, we don't want them to be uh, inundated uh, with calls directly to them. We do ask, if people have questions for the families, that you reach out to us so that we can filter and help the families deal with this so that they can focus on their children. Are the kids still riding the bus? The kids are not riding that bus. Uh, hopefully, we'll figure out a good solution to their transportation needs soon. I think I heard September or August is when they first started riding the bus and they were coming here. Yeah. That's when they first noticed it. And the different families raised concerns at different times with the school. The school had noticed before Thanksgiving of last year, for sure. And so through that time, through that time from August, September till March, when this really was a, a catalyst moment, how would you characterize the school district's response as being a sort of a conscious effort? I'm not going to be so kind as to say it was negligent, because I imagine my children at that school district on that bus, and this was far worse than negligence. It was gross inattention. Gross negligence might describe it better, but complete and utter failure. They had notice, they had cameras, they didn't have another good explanation for why these children were having these suspicious ruses. If they suspected the parents were doing it, they should have done something about that. If they suspected it was happening at the school, they should have done something about that. They had everything they needed to pinpoint where this was happening. It was happening on that bus. They had video that showed it was happening on the bus, and they ignored all of that evidence. And from what I understand, the superintendent told one of the families the day before he received a phone call from Kelly Clark that there was a parent issue? They said something along those lines. And uh, we are hopeful that the school district did that because they didn't know any better and they were still investigating. We don't want to find out that they knew better and lied to these families on purpose. Did with the, the problem with the school district only looked at one video, is that right? And did you guys get a hold of additional video and discovered it? Or how did this additional video, video show any abuse surface? We don't know how many videos the school looked at. I'm going to ask my partner, Kwasar Mohammed Bai, to answer a couple of these questions. He has more information. Sure. So there is an email on the website that shows that they looked at one, they stated that they looked at one video and they may have looked at the day before. And that was it. That's what they said to the families at the time when they were put on notice back in January. And simply, uh, there was nothing done after that. And, and then this video, how did this video surface? Is this something you guys toured and got hold of? No. Um, so how this happened is that on the 18th, after we saw that bowling ball sized bruise on uh, the son's foot, mother finally raised her volume to yet another level because she had been ignored as she was screaming for the last few months. That finally got the Littleton Public Schools to look at the video again. Law enforcement were called, and then the mother, after receiving that call, went to Littleton Public Schools, and she was shown a snippet of it. That was all she could stomach as she was recording that video that they were playing for her. Now our understanding is all of the footage is in the possession of law enforcement, and we're not gonna get access to it until a future date. I wanna be clear, there are multiple, multiple vi videos, multiple victims, uh, same perpetrator, same institution, enabling and then empowering her to do it. Why is Eagle Wood investigating and not Littleton PD? Right, so our understanding is that on the bus route, it crosses numerous um, cities. I think the most important part here is that all of these crimes and all of these abuses happen in Arapahoe County. So we have the District Attorney's Office of Arapahoe County prosecuting it. And uh, I don't think it particularly matters which one it is, but I think it's 
I think the best guess of the police so far is that the majority of these, what we're seeing, happened in the city of Inglewood rather than Middleton. So the question is, was Dax on the bus the longest of all the children? One of the parents says she does not know how long, but he's on the bus uh, every day, back and forth, for at least 40 minutes each way. And just a point of clarification to the point of the, the charges that they made for these cases. Is it just for the one, or are there multiple charges for the different people? Because I know you're identifying, unfortunately, more victims, but did you arrest uh, the entire family? Mm -hmm. the, the family's not involved in the criminal process. Th that would be a question best left sure. to the uh, John Kellner and the 18th Judicial District. Our understanding um, is that there is a significant ongoing investigation, and obviously what we're seeing on just this one short video um, is quite severe, and we expect uh, future criminal charges to be brought that would be commensurate with what we're seeing in the video. And That is correct. Are you okay if we move back to Dean? I know you said you didn't want to make the other judge feel bad. Will you call but, but we do not want but we do not want the other the other families may not feel that way. And so um, while they are permitting it, I would like uh, no other references to the sons of the other uh, families. Yes, come on up. Come on. Um, that's a, a big part of the feeling of betrayal. Um, I was very friendly with her. Um, we had initially began talking back and forth because I can't see the street from the way that our house is positioned. So I gave her my phone number so she could let me know when she was close. Um, and we just became friendly that way. But I, I bought this woman Christmas gifts um, in the winter holidays and made tea for her when she wasn't feeling good. Um, so she, she had definitely had me fooled. We'll take one more question. Will you call for the resignation of the superintendent? Okay, hold on. Let's go. We'll take two questions. We'll do that. <laughs> Let's start with, uh, Colleen. Um, healing from a traumatic event like this is not quick or linear. Um, so he has really good days. Um, I think he's happy to know that he's safe now. Um, but since being off that bus um, that following Tuesday, March 19th, um, he got his light back um, that she took from him. Um, but he's still... You know, it hasn't even been a month, so he, we're still going through it, but he's safe now, so that's what's important. Question regarding the superintendent. Will you call for the resignation of the superintendent, and to your knowledge, did, has this superintendent seen any cases like this in, in his district? Sorry, so the first part of the question is, as Mr. Aukin said, the family is eager to have a dialogue with the Littleton Public Schools. We would like to give them the opportunity to do the right thing. Uh, so far, it's been a disappointing response by the Littleton Public School and the superintendent, but we're hoping that they reflect on this and that they do the right thing voluntarily rather than they have it imposed on them. The second part is that there is a second incident that happened in Poudre Valley. Um, we are not involved in that. The only information we know about it is what's been publicly reported. It is our understanding 
and when this abuse was happening in that school district, the superintendent of Littleton Public Schools was the superintendent at that time. He transferred to Littleton after that, and this has happened again. Um, like I said in my statement, and all the parents have touched on, our kids can't talk to us. We can't ask them questions, we can't interview them, and much of their communication is just by us knowing their faces, knowing what's going on in their head by their body language, their gestures. Um, and it was a heavy decision to make to uncover it, um, but we cannot bring attention to this if we don't look at it. And it's ugly to look at, but it's important um, to see how confused and afraid he was in that video. Just speaks to his vulnerability. Um, and it speaks to the terror that he had to endure while on that bus. Um, and like I said, he had to live through that. So it's the least that everyone else can do to look at it. I think there was one more. Was it Allison? I was just trying to get a clarification on that um, report. Um, the sheriff said the bus was still on the bus, but off camp on my visit, I had to view the child off camp. It was really, it was just pretty bad. The amount of abuse and stuff, it just sent my world to how they were trying to get at it off camp. So there is an email that we have shown. It's a document. Joan, do you want to pull it up? And this is an email that has members of the Littleton Public Schools speaking with Joshua, and they are back in January. So this is both schools communicating to themselves about the possibility of the abuse happening on the bus. So I think it's fair to say, Allison, that they were simultaneously put on notice in various ways. Some of the families were showing pictures of their abused children directly to Joshua. Some of them were speaking directly to Littleton. The families, as they were processing the abuse that's happening to their children, were acting independently. Right. Um, they were just advocating for their children as they had done for their children's entire lives. And so the big picture here is that both schools were put on notice. Both schools were aware of it. They suspected the possibility. And then it continued to happen. I believe it's accurate to say that uh, some of the parents were showing um, and communicating the abuse of their children back in the fall. Let's ask. Raise your hand if you reached out to uh, any school in September of last year about bruises you saw on your child. Raise your hand if you reached out in October. November. Okay, so you got September, October, November uh, raised hand. They reached out to these schools gave them notice that something was going on that they needed to look into right away. Are all the kids still going to Joshua? Yes. Yes. All right, thank you very much. Um, we appreciate your time.